is one of those religious things that sits out in your field and eats all your produce and just doesn't return anything. It just eats all the life out of you and it doesn't do any good. It just doesn't do any good. Well, we're going to kill ourselves a sacred cow today. I'm going to shoot this one dead, I hope. I hope to God. Now, see, we're a charismatic church, which means we're usually in trouble of some sort. And... uh you don't have to deal with some of these things. Well, actually, you do in some of the more denominational churches, but it tends to be just something that's very strong in our charismatic churches that I want to really deal with today. Okay? Well, we're going to be talking today about the third part of the interpersonal covenant that David and Jonathan, or Jonathan and David, modeled for us that we've been finding out that Jesus is also doing. Now, Jonathan and David, Jonathan the stronger gave the weaker his tokens. Well, the third thing he gave him was very, very powerful. First thing he gave him was his robe. Second, second, the second thing he gave him was his garments. Robe, outer garment, identity. Second, garments, provision. I'll take care of you. The third he gave was his weapons. He gave him his weapons. He gave him his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now, that's kind of interesting. Why did he give all that? Oh, man, it's kind of interesting because the belt ties the whole thing together. You put your sword on it. You put your quiver on it. You, you hang everything you got on that belt. That belt's very, very important. Okay, But he gave him those. Why? Well, let's talk about that. His weapons are not for us to use to fight. Now, we're going to find out a little bit more about this. Jonathan did not give David his weapons so that David would go out and fight for him. Wrong plan. What was his weapons? He gave him his weapons as an understanding that I will fight your battles. It was just an understanding. It was just a token of the covenant. I will fight your battles. I will fight for you. He didn't give David his weapons saying, boy, I hope David comes out and fights for me. Well, it would have been good because David was probably the best warrior in the land. But Jonathan, that was not what he's in it for. He was in it out of love. And he said, I'm here to tell you, David, that I will fight your battles. And he did, to a degree. Now see, a lot of the times, if David would have just asked Jonathan, Jonathan, would you fight for me? No problem. Jonathan would have been there. Actually, he did. He says, why is your father fighting me? He says, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. So you go find out. And he used Jonathan in Saul's house to find out what Saul was doing. And Jonathan actually came to David and said, you're right. Saul's trying to kill you. Get out of here. And he actually preferred David and his covenant with David over his relationship with his father. That's pretty wild. What's more important in relationship? Our relationship with our covenant partner or our family? Actually, our covenant partner. Jesus comes before my family. Jesus comes before my family. Hear this again one more time for those of you who think I'm crazy and think, oh, you rotten, lousy person. No, Jesus comes before my family. I don't want to make my family my God. No, I know who my God is. And guess what? That makes me able to do with my family what I need to do. Okay? When I start focusing on just my family, I have a tendency to get so sucked into it that it just sucks me dead. My family is not my focal point. My God is. They've said in so many places that I've been to for pastoral ministry, God first, family second, ministry third. I have found exception to that. I have found I don't like that. And they say, why not? Because it's God first and God second and God third. God is the only list. Because when God is my total focal point, I will minister to my family better. When God is my only focal point, I will have a ministry. And when I listen to what he is saying, I will not spend so much time in ministry that I neglect my family. You understand? See, God is not into directing us to do that. We have got to understand. God will direct us to do what? Take care of family. It's God first, second, third, fourth, ninth, twentieth, hundred, and ninetieth. He's the list. All there is to it. Okay. It means he will do the fight for us. That's very, very important for us to know. Protection, though, is the issue. The issue here is protection. Marty, I'm starting to get a little ring up here. 
Warfare is very, very real. Now, I'm, I'm going to be the first person to tell you, I believe in spiritual warfare. If you don't believe in spiritual warfare, then don't start having men's purity conferences. Things come unglued when you start ministering to men in the area of sexual purity. Man, you think I haven't understood the fight? I have understood the fight. Has there been attacks against me and my family? Absolutely. Have there been attacks against the men who have done this with me in this ministry? Yeah, absolutely. Huh, Jim? If I can't pick on Randall, he's not here today. So I can pick on you. Okay? But it's true. Fact is, the intercessors that I trained in doing this, the first time we did this here, and I had a, I told the intercessors to come and I'll train them how to do intercession, they were all women. That was interesting. And I said, okay, here's how you pray. And we started going down the line and listing exactly the warfare that they were going to get themselves into. And I didn't list them all. I mean, I didn't tell everything because, I mean, I could be here all day. I just told them to watch out for it. And all of a sudden, one of the women came to me and says, I have had these gross and disgusting sexual dreams. Why? And I, I, it caught me off guard enough that I giggled. And she said, you think that's funny? Uh, yeah. Why? Because the Lord is showing you what these men are having to deal with. So you can pray. He goes, oh, mercy. That's what they're dealing with. Yeah. But see, the understanding was that she was saying all oh, these perverts, these junky, scummy men, what's up with that? Why can't they just act right and be good? Because they don't know. Women, If you, you don't know what men have to deal with mentally. You really don't. You have no idea of this warfare and sexual fight. You don't know. You can't know. There's no way for you to understand. Okay? But God brought to the intercessor's attention what warfare the men were having to go through just to get free. Pretty, extent, pretty intense. It'd kill you if you're not ready. Okay? But God was preparing them to do the fight. Why? He was the one who was doing the fight for the men. He was bringing up people to do intercession, and we'll bring up intercession in just a bit. If you learn nothing else today, learn this. You're not the warrior. He is. He is the warrior. Jesus is the warrior. He's the one that's coming to come against the nations with the sword out of his mouth. Now, guys, we're going to be hitting a lot of scripture today. And understand, I'm not trying to cram an entire seminar on spiritual warfare into one day. Well, yes, I am. But I'm not going to be exhaustive. But well, I'm going to hit a bunch of stuff today, okay? Because we're going to understand a little bit about spiritual warfare. If you don't know there's a fight, you're dangerous. You are dangerous to be with. If you don't know we're in a war, then my fighting with you means I have to do more protecting on you than I do of doing the fight or any part of it. I, the Lord is the same way. Are we going to be warriors for him? Well, for one, he's the warrior, but we're the tools. But if we don't know we're in a warfare, we're not even going to be available. And we're going to be dangerous. And we're going to be ones that are going to be taken out because of that. You've got to know. He's the warrior. Warfare is really real. Now I'm going to do this succinctly and quickly and carefully. But we are going to go through Ephesians 6. And we're going to go through the armor of our warfare. And there's a reason why. Ephesians chapter 6 starting in verse 10. And it says this. And you can turn there. These scriptures will be up there. Okay. For the rest, my brothers, be made powerful in the Lord and in the might of His strength. Stop. Before we can ever go on to understanding the, war, the armor of the Lord, understand it says be, be made powerful in the Lord. Okay? This is very, very important. Um, David had a hard time when he went to fight Goliath because he finally got everybody to understand that he was going to go fight Goliath. And then Saul drug him in here and said, Okay, I'll let you go, but here's my armor. Now here's a man who was over seven foot tall, Saul, and a little shepherd boy out of nowhere, how old, 14 maybe? And he had never tested this armor, meaning what? He had never tried it. He had never worked with this armor. Can you imagine the size of helmet a seven-foot guy had as opposed to a 14-year-old kid, normal kid? Saul was head and shoulders, head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. How big was his armor? And David had to wear it? Now, see, the problem was David did not have the strength physically to use armor. 
He had never used it. That was not how he had trained. And he says, forget it. I got an armor that doesn't weigh much. And he says, and I have tested it. I'm going to put on the armor that God has. Don't worry. I'll be fine. I killed the lion. I killed the bear. God had already put him in situations where he had seen the victory. And so for him to see the victory in Goliath, he was already clothed in victory. He had already seen himself. He had put on the robe, you understand? He had put on the robe. He already saw himself as the victor before he ever went out. He told Goliath, he says, you scum. Oh, this is Eddie translation. You scum. I'm going to feed you to the birds. Because Goliath said that to him first. I'm going to feed you to the birds, to the animals of the field. I'm going to feed your little, tiny little carcass. He says, oh, no, 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 no. Not me that's going to be lunch. It's you. And they won't even get to you because we're going to kill everybody else around you. And the birds are going to be so gorged, they won't even eat you all. Deal with that, critter. He says, how do you know David knew he was going to win? He called Goliath a what? An uncircumcised Philistine. And he says, you are not of the covenant of my God, and I am. You're dead. I am wearing the armor of my covenant. For the rest, my brothers, be made powerful in the Lord. In the Lord. Being in the Lord, powerful in Him, and in the might of His strength. Okay? We're going to be talking about each one of those words. But here's the thing. If you aren't trained and strong, going into the battle with armor is useless. You'll never carry it. You can't carry it. You'll see why in a bit. It isn't about your power. The fact is, your power is the problem. You don't have any. It's about His. And when I am in Him, I have His power to carry His armor. Okay? This is very important. We keep sending people out who are not willing to put the discipline into becoming strong in the Lord. Forget the armor, folks. We've got to be strong in the Lord. Are, what are you doing to know Him so much that you know Him, what He's going to do? Faith is not knowing what God can do. Faith is knowing what God will do. Faith is having the relationship with Him so that He can tell you exactly what He's doing and you'll understand it. Amen. That's faith. Be strong in the Lord. Man, I've got to have the strength before I ever walk into the battle. Now, for those of you who have ever been to the military, oh, and I've got to say this even though Mike is not here. Mike rebuked me last week. Mike Coiner rebuked me. He says, sure, you talk about Rick and you talk about Ron, and you even talk about your sister. He says, what do they know about the military? They don't know anything about the military. They were officers. <laughs> you want to talk about the military, you talk to us grunts. Like this. And so Mike Coiner, he won the, won the point. I understand. Okay, he was the grunt in the army. He knew. Okay, a little bit different than all these officer types that got away with everything in the world. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. Ron sat in his fancy millions and dollars of airplane and sat there and all these grunts ran around his airplane and did everything. Just launched him off. He had the easy part. What's up with that? <laughs> okay. The first word there, be made powerful in the Lord, is the Greek word dunamis. We get our word dynamite exactly from that word, dunamis. It means power. Be made powerful in him. Now, it's kind of interesting I could have Randall up here holding a sword, and you would say, he's fairly powerful. He has the strength to wield it. Okay? I could bring Cody up here, okay? And he would play with that sword all day long. He would love playing with that. He would love to have the permission. They even have it in his hands. Okay? That's true. Does he have the power? No. Can't swing it. Can't wield it. The person who has the power is the person who can do something. Okay? You ever been powerless? It's not fun. What's it mean to have power? You have the ability to do something. Kind of fascinating. I had Miranda's car stuck in our driveway because she had bald tires on all four. Big old 16 inch snowstorm, and there her car sits in our driveway. You can put it in gear and she goes, Vroom. it doesn't even move. <laughs> so I got George out. Whoa. George, powerful truck, <laughs> weighs 5,900 pounds, <laughs> got him out and hooked a chain on something because these cars today are not made to be towed anywhere, there's nothing to hook to, 
Finally got underneath that thing and hooked to something, and George wouldn't move. Why? All his power, he, all he has is those military tires, and they're just, just, just slick as hers. And there he sat and spun. All fours. And you'd move sideways. And her car just sat there. Okay? So... So much for the boss. So much for those... Yeah. So I had to actually humble myself. Yeah, we pushed. It didn't help. Okay? To actually go over and ask Randall to bring his Ford Ooh. over <laughs> and hook it up. And, but he had the tires to, to handle it. Okay? And he pulled her right out. It's not a big deal. Who had the power? Randall did. Randall had none. I had all this power in George that if I had a regular wasn't snow out there, I had no problem, but it was not. I was powerless in George. 53 Dodge Army power wagon, and he just sits there and goes, hmm. Useless. Okay, at that point. Ah, dunamis. Who has the power? Well, it says that you're supposed to be powerful. You have the power. Now let's look at Let's just make an example. Your neighbor, okay, is having a major problem in his marriage. And he's damaged. And he's hurting. And he needs help. Who has the power to help him? Now see, now we're cutting to the chase here. Who has? You do, if you make yourself powerful in the Lord. Because the only one who has the true power is the Lord. And He wants to walk through you, but if you're not going to be disciplined enough to carry the Lord there, you'll not see the power happen. Your neighbor is sick. He needs healing. Who's going to take it to him? I know, you're going to call the pastor. You're going to call somebody. Anybody know a good Christian? Okay, that's, that's you. You do the discipline to learn how to hear from God. You take healing to Him. Don't be looking for anybody else. Nobody, any, nobody else is different than you. What do they have? This discipline to hear from God and actually availability to be used of Him. Powerful in the Lord. And in the krateo. I know. The what? The krateo of his iskus. Yeah, amen, yeah. What does that mean? Okay, krateo means dominion. The dominating power, the power to take an area and dominate it. That's a good word, krateo. I like that. Of his strength, he's got the strength. Kind of one of those fascinating little deals. I do some weightlifting. <laughs> I do minuscule amounts of weightlifting compared to some. Okay? Amazing what somebody with the right strength can carry, can lift, can do. Amazing to me. Amazing. Why? Because if they have the strength, they also have the authority to dominate in a certain area. He who has the strength dominates. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe that, just go get into any sport. The one that has the ability and the strength, they dominate. I've played tennis against people that I swear... They had a teletransporter or a time warp continuum deal because they hit the ball and went past me. I never even saw it. <laughs> they dominated. I know it's like to get in a racquetball court and have somebody, you know, six, five, two hundred and fifty pounds with some kind of killer blow, and I'm out there trying to run around. <laughs> no, they dominate. They fill the court. There's nowhere to get around them. Okay? I won anyway. Just want to let you know. <laughs> that was because, well, <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> it's another story. Okay. The weaker I am in me, the more powerful I am in Him. And the more I get to understand it is not my fight, the more I win. If I have to do all the fight to get there, I'm going to lose this thing. What am I going to know? I'm going to go into a session and somebody's going to come in and they have had satanic ritual abuse. And everybody goes, ah. Listen, it's not my fight. It's not my battle. It's not my victory. It's not my concern. Go where God calls me to go and do what He calls me to do. And we've seen victories. Why? Because I'm just the donkey that carries Him. That's the end of that. Ephesians 6.11, the next verse says, Put on all the armor of God for you to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, those of you who have gone through uh, Romans chapter 6 with me, and we've talked about the weapons of our warfare, right? the weapons of your body, remember? I said that's the word opla, 
Okay, not instruments, but weapons. This word put on all the armor is one word, panoplion. It's panta opla. It's all the armor, all the weaponry. Put on all the armor of God for you to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. To take a stand against his trickery. Now the word wiles there is the Greek word methodios, methods. We get the word method right from it, methodios. And it means to stand in the way, in the middle. Okay, it means, but it, the real meaning of it is trickery. To be just downright sneaky. Okay, I want to be able to stand against the sneakiness of the devil. Why? Because that's all he's got against me. Now listen, that's all he's got is lies. He's got no other weapon. Why are we cowering before an enemy who is useless? Toothless, weaponless, and completely harmless. You say, you're talking about Satan? Yeah. Why are we worried about him? Nowhere should, does it tell us to be afraid of him. Nowhere. And it keeps on saying, do not be afraid. Why? Because there's nothing to be afraid of. When I'm in Christ, what's he going to do to me? Nothing. I am not unaware of his schemes, but what does he have? He has years and years and years of sneakiness. I have learned not to pick on old men. Too bad. Boy, they will get you. They may not have the prowess of the young athletic types, but they are sneaky. They've been around. They've learned, haven't you? What? <laughs> See, even acts innocent. We know better, okay? Sneak, my old man, my father, by the way, he thought... When we call him the old man, he considered that a term of endearment. That was, you know, a lot of people think that's a, a term of rancor or whatever. Slam. No, not my dad. My dad thought that was neat. He's the old man. He says, I live this long and I'm proud of it. I am their old man. Well, he would get you. It might take him a week. You'll forget sooner or later because you're running around through life and he'll get you. He remembered, and he's sneaky. Same thing with the devil. He's been around a long time. Is he going to get me? No. Why? Because I'm going to stay in the armor. I'm not getting out of it. I want to be able to stand against the trickiness of the devil. Verse 12 says, Because wrestling against flesh and blood is not to us. That's a weird way of putting it, but I kept it up there anyway. But it's not for us to wrestle against flesh and blood. Who am I fighting? Is Will Davis my enemy? Do I have to fight him? No. Okay? Understand, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Well, what if the guy is an unsaved, running dog heathen, nasty, mean, vicious, cruel person that has something against me? He is still not my enemy. He is just being used of the enemy. <laughs> okay? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against other things. Okay, I like my little dragon. He yeah, ain't yeah, cool. <sighs> That's a bad breath. Okay, because wrestling against flesh and blood is not to us, but against, and, it, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, rulers against authorities, against the world's rulers, the darkness of this age, against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenlies. Is that a hierarchical list? Is that a divisional list? Is there a difference between a world leader and a spiritual darkness? Well, you know, there's not much data given. Everybody has their little opinion, but my thing is, who cares? I'm going to wrestle with only what God gives me to wrestle with, and I'm going to win anyway. Okay? Now, I do know that there are, there are things. We could not deal with certain things over a certain country. People said, you're in Russia. Now you have authority over the demons of Russia. No, I don't. I do not have territorial authority. I don't have spiritual authority over all of them. But... They can't work in my family because I do have a territorial authority in my family and over my ministries that I had there. And we, we paid attention to this. We learned this one. There's a spirit of distrust over this entire region. Nobody trusts anybody. Why? Well, they bred that into you. You had to turn, turn in your parents to the Communist Party if they were speaking sedition. Uh -huh. no, nobody trusted anybody. Everybody's walking around just like... Well, same thing. Communism was gone, but it didn't matter. Nobody trusted anybody. And we got to the point where in the ministry, all the different missionaries together, we didn't trust anybody either. 
We didn't trust each other. It was starting to worm into our families where I couldn't trust my wife. I wasn't trusting my kids. I wasn't trusting anybody. And I was like, this isn't right. There's something wrong here. It was a spirit of distrust all over Russia, Eastern Europe. It wasn't just in Russia. It's in Poland. It's all the way down through the, through the Caucasus and through all that area. Spirit of distrust. Man, and it beat on us. And one day we thought, this isn't right. What are we going to do? Well, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I don't care what principality, what area he has. I can resist him and he'll flee from, flee from us. So we made the decision to trust people. Isn't that, isn't that horrible? Doesn't that sound like real nasty spiritual warfare? We chose to trust people. I chose to trust my wife. I chose to trust my kids. I chose to trust the people I worked with. I chose to trust the Russians we worked with. I chose to. And guess what happened? He fled from me. The people I chose to trust, I could. Interesting. We started teaching this to the other missionaries, and pretty soon our whole ministry it had no effect on us anymore. Spirit of distrust. We started keeping our eyes open to what kind of principalities were over the different areas, and we just resisted them, and they fled. Does this sound like terrible warfare? It gets you thinking. You have to know the methods of the enemy. We had those things. Flesh and blood, however, can be used by them. I might have an enemy that's flesh and blood. He is coming against me. What's the problem? It's not him that's the problem. It's what's behind him that's the problem. Therefore, if I love my enemy, I will learn how to get him out of the hands of the real enemy. Am I making sense? But people are not your problem. People have problems. They're not your problem. The problem is behind them, what they are doing. Verse 13 says this. Here we go. Because of this, take up all the armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having worked out all things to stand. Take up all the armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. Now this word is the word anthistami. To resist. What does anthistami mean? Anthistami uh, literally means, now I could probably get Justin and Micah. Micah, come on up here, you two. Come here. Real hurry, hurry, hurry. hurry. Quick, 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 quick. Micah, stand here. Face that way. Which way? Justin, stand here. Face him. Okay, put your arms on each other. Okay. No. Okay, now. Justin, when I say go, I want you to push him against that wall. And Micah, I want you to push him against that wall. Oh, no. On your mark, get set, go! Come on, guys, come on! Push, 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 push. Okay, that's good. You may sit down. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now, what was that? Micah heard that it was Justin's job to push him that way, and he said, I'm going to anthestame me right here. I'm going to stand against it. I don't care what, what Justin's will was. Here and no further. I'm going to stand. That you take up all the armor of God that you may be able, the word is dunamis again, that you have the power to resist in an evil day. I can. Things are going to happen. Are we going to have evil days? Oh, yeah. Guess what? You win. You can resist. You can do it. Here, no further. Satan says, I'm coming in. <laughs> yeah, like a flood, just let alone. When the enemy comes in like a flood, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. See, I sang that song for a reason this morning. How about this word, and having worked out all things, kater gadzomai. There's one you can throw on your friends, Ron. Do that during the middle of just, oh yeah, why no kater gadzomai, so there. This, this right in the middle here where it's E-R-G-A, erga, means to work. Kata, K-A-T-A, thrown on the front of it, means down. It means to work down to a fine point. To get it down. And having worked out all things. See, here's the thing. The enemy tries to fake me out with all sorts of lies and junk and crud and idiosity. I mean, it's just amazing. He says, you aren't worthy to be a Christian. And he shows me all the stupid things I've done. He says, see, you're not worthy to be a fighter. You're not worthy of all this. Shut up. 
I worked out all things. One of the things I worked out is the fact that what Jesus says about me, not what you say about me. I don't care if you think I'm unworthy. I know that he says I am. Don't tell me that you think I'm inadequate. I don't care if you think I'm inadequate. Don't lie to me. I've worked it out. Down to the fine line. I am not inadequate because I've been to my Lord and he has told me I'm not. He has shown me. This is the working it out. And folks, if you can't work it out on your own, that's what other Christians are here for. We'll help you work it out. Let's find out what areas are stopping you. Let's get rid of them. Because that's what it... I want to be able in the evil day to resist. I'm going to do it. I'm going to have it down, worked out, and in all things. And when it finally comes down to it, I'm going to stand. Just stay me. Just stand. Not just stand against, but just stand. I'm standing. He can't take me down. I love this. You see this? I'm going to answer Stamy so I can cut her gears on my enough that I can hear Stamy. You know what? You know what I'm saying? Got it covered. Amen. Amen. I'm going to resist and I'm going to work out all things and I'm going to be able to stand. And nobody, nobody, nobody is going to take me out. Now that's, that's a place of rest, isn't it? Not a place of work. It's a place of rest. But that means I've been strong in the Lord. I've disciplined myself to have strength in Him. I've disciplined myself to work out all things. And so I know what's going on. The enemy can't fake me out anymore. He can't take me down. It irritates the fire out of him too. So what? I like irritating him. It works out for me. Then it goes on. Verse 14 says, Then stand firm, having girded your loins about with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now this belt of truth is not a belt. It's more than just a belt. Mine's broken. Miranda put it on. And uh, what it really what it really is is it's something that goes all the way around that protects some very interesting parts for me. Okay, parts that I have a great interest in protecting. My wallet. No. <laughs> goes all the way around. That's parts are broken. It's supposed to go all the way around. It did go around when I first made this. Does that show you? Um, forget it. Anyway, <laughs> there was a time when I was a little thinner. Okay. What did the belt do? The belt held all the rest of the armor together. It was things I could hang things on. It's whatever I could do. But the breast, the belt is called the what? The belt of truth. And what did it surround? Well, the life-giving parts. I'll tell you this straight out and simple. Men who get into sexual problems, the first thing that goes is the truth. If Ted Haggard had been truthful, he wouldn't be where he is today. What did he lie about? His problem. He said so. Folks, I'm not, I'm not picking on Ted. Chuck's every man that I've ever met has had the same problem. When we are denying what we're doing and we're not truthful about it, we'll keep the problem simple and straight. Okay? Truth covers what? Our life-giving capacity. Our ability to give life to somebody else. Truth. Now, wait a minute. He is the truth. So this first part of armor that I'm going to be putting on is what? It's him. I'm still putting on him. And I've got to put on him in the areas that I need him. He's going to hold everything else together, but he's going to take care of my life-giving parts. I'm going to be able to give life to people. I'm going to be covered because I'm in the truth. Well, how about the breastplate of righteousness? What's the breastplate of righteousness all about? Well, breastplate is kind of like the important one, isn't it? I watch a lot of movies of warfare and battles and all that good stuff. And it irritates the fire out of me that everybody who wears the armor doesn't matter. Every, a single arrow kills him. You never see the, air, the armor dinged up. You never do. Right, just one simple little one goes right through his armor. I'm sorry, someday somebody's going to have to show it right. That's armor. I don't fit in this anymore. I, Kimberly might fit in this. <laughs> but this is real plate steel. 
Okay, that's what it is. Just It's a chunk of steel with chunks of steel holding it in place. I could take a bullet. It would knock me over. It would hurt like fire. But I could take the bullet unless it was armor-piercing. Okay? Did you know that most people live through armor-piercing shots? Why? It's an itty-bitty hole. It goes through, doesn't expand, doesn't do much. Okay? So this is kind of like a fascinating little deal. A regular lead bullet would expand on this thing. It would dent it, which hurts like crazy. To wear this and have a thing dented in, that's going to hurt. Hurt is different than dead. Okay? I, you know, hurt we can handle. I can live another day and be damaged. But man, can you... What does this cover? It covers the heart. What else does it cover? It covers the kidneys. It covers all sorts of life, uh, very vital, 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 vital things. Okay? Anyway, there's your, there's your, your breastplate. Folks, above all else, guard your heart. For out of it come the very issues of life. You want to kill somebody? Poke a hole in their heart. Did you see that thing in the newspaper yesterday or this, this week? I don't know. I read a lot of newspapers this week because I was getting caught up. A baby was born with his heart outside his chest. And the, the doctors wrapped it in Gore-Tex. Stuffed it back in there. And they're making, right now it's plastic protectors, but they're going to do bone grafts and everything and make a sternum and the whole nine yards. And they say, he'll be able to do anything any other kid is except for a full contact sport that hit him in the heart. You can do anything else. That's in Miami. I thought that was pretty cool. How do they do that? That just fascinates me that they can, that they can do that. Verses 15 and 16 say, And having shod the feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now let's stop with that one first. Okay? The preparation of the gospel of peace, not peace. People say, I have my shoes of peace. No. It's the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now listen. If I wanted somebody to go to my house, there are a few people here that have enough calluses on their feet that they can just walk over there, no problem, and come back. Not very many. Because between the gate and my house is all these pine needles and pine cones that I don't want to pick up with my hand, just straight. I wear gloves when I pick that stuff up. It'll, it, it hurts. So to be able to go there, you need shoes. You need something. What are shoes for? Shoes, they'll tell you, an army moves on its feet. If you can't get good shoes to your army, you're done. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought because a Union, I mean a Confederate group, saw an ad in newspaper about a shoe company in Gettysburg that said all sizes for everybody. And they were going to go in because so many of their, their soldiers had no shoes, their bare feet. And they were going to go in and raid this warehouse and get shoes for their troops. They sent somebody in to say, is there any union around there? And they said, no. And they got to Gettysburg and found out there were three regiments there. Well... The fight ensued. Gettysburg was all over shoes. Okay? Yeah, and Miranda goes, shoes. Whoa, oh, 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 yes. <laughs> and there will be no other fight than to see a sail on shoes. On that, right? No. The feet shod. I don't have any with me. I, could, I forgot to get my greaves out. Greaves. Yeah, they're in the shop there, and they're, they're chunks of, of brass that cover from the knee to the top of the foot. I can kick somebody very efficiently with my greaves. Okay? But they're mostly to keep me from getting damaged so that I can continue to walk. But the thing is, is this. If I don't have the shoes, I can't go. What is it that I need to do? The preparation of the gospel of peace. Are you prepared to give the good news of peace to people? Are you prepared? See, it's right back to the discipline, getting strong in the Lord, of taking care of yourself and getting ready to go. Do you have the preparation of the gospel of peace? Well, listen, if you're living a life of turmoil, then you don't even have the gospel of peace, let alone the preparation of it. Ooh, there, that was a, that was a ouch. Okay. Folks, listen, 
if I have the gospel of peace, then I'm not just, I am in peace, my family is in peace, we're not chewed up, we're not in turmoil all the time, we're not in strife all the time, we have peace. And that gives me the good news that that peace can happen to somebody else. But if it doesn't happen to me, I don't have it to give. I have to have something to give to somebody. Amen? Okay, I'm spending too much time here. Go on. Then it says, Above all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the darts of the evil one being kindled. Above all is positional, not importance. It doesn't mean above all, though this is the most important thing. Above them all, you have to have this one. It means above all. Okay, in the grammar. Above all. Now, shields are neat. Shields are neat. I have this one all ready to go for Jared. We've got to make a commercial, so I have all these extra straps on it, but... It's not either. It's a shield. It may have been a piece of pen. One no, it is. It's the bottom of a 55-gallon drum. That's what it is. Okay? But it's solid, and I can hurt you with it. Okay? This is my shield. Above all. See how it works? Darts coming in. Shield. Above all. I can shield myself with that. It's one of the funniest parts in the Braveheart when they're yelling at all the guys across and they go shooting their arrows and everybody ducks behind their little shields and the little arrows come through. Boop. Have wooden shields. That's smart. They'll stop for a while. Nothing like a metal shield. I like metal shields. They're cool. You like my metal shield? This thing is a fascinating shield. It does exactly what it's supposed to. It stops things from hitting me. Now, being the smart, intelligent people we are, we've put the shield on and thrown stuff at it. We've hit it with swords. What other family do you know? Okay, forget it. Anyway, but we have, and I'll tell you something, that hurts. I'm sorry, it's just a piece of steel on my arm. You swing that thing, whack, ow! However, I still have my arm. If I didn't have the shield and it did the same thing, it'd been ow also. Minus parts. Okay? The shield works. It's positional, not by importance. And you have the shield of faith wherewith you will be able to do what? Quench all the darts of the evil one that have been kindled. Okay? The fiery darts. All, 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 all the darts. Now I've got to stress this point. People say, oh, I've, I can duck a lot of them, but so many got through. Oh, and then where was your faith? It's the shield of what? Faith. What is faith? Faith is a relational thing. It's something between people. I must trust a person. My faith is in Jesus Christ. Now, wait a minute. When my faith is in Him, because He is the armor, no darts get through Him. No darts get through him. Okay? Now, Randall could stand in the back of the church and shoot with his compound bow at my shield, and guess what would happen? It would hurt, but they would not get through. They're just arrows. Okay? I understand the warfare, but I'm going to be safe. What am, where am I safe? I'm safe in my relationship with Jesus Christ because I'm trusting him. My faith is in him. My faith is a relational thing, not this... Ooh, do you have enough faith? I don't know. God didn't install a faith meter. I don't know where it said. <laughs> it's a relationship with Him. Can you trust Him? Oh, now there's the issue, isn't it? There's the issue. Anything He can kindle, I'm safe from. Anything the enemy can kindle, I'm safe from. I don't care. All the fiery darts of the enemy. All the things that he's lit, he's kindled. He fire them at me, no problem. Isn't that neat? What a confidence. What a confidence. What a real confidence. And be, verse 17 says, Also take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now the helmet of salvation is kind of fascinating. Uh, it's one piece of true armor they give to every one of the United States soldiers. What is it? It's a helmet. Why? 
there's something about a head that's pretty important. Okay. Anybody here ever have a headache? Do you think real well when you have a headache? No. All intelligence goes right out the window with the thing. All I can say is, ow. They open the curtains. Ow. Tell that cat to quit stomping across the floor. Ow. Okay, helmet. Helmet's a cool thing. I have a broom on my head. I thought I'd clean up my thoughts. <laughs> I can see. Thank you. When I tell you what this is actually made out of, though, that better? What do you know that's round and brass? Hmm? A spittoon. Somebody got it. Yes, that's true. Okay, I found it. I made it. Deal. <laughs> Never was used, praise God. But what is really funny is right here embossed in it is a, a train um, engine. Behind there is a train engine. There's a train car, and I found it. It was round enough, and I got the other parts and pieces and hit it. I put the broom on it. What can I tell you? I just wanted to know what it felt. See, the reason I made all this is I want to know what it felt like to wear armor. So I did it all, and I wore it. And it's very uncomfortable. This isn't the kind of things you lounge around in, unless you're Sandy. Sandy would lounge around in armor, wouldn't you? But if, she, if I got her to wear it, she'd lounge around it, because that's what she does. She lounges around, right? That's a... <laughs> Okay. Finish this quote. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of saved thinking. The word is sophroneo, salvation, sozo, and froneo, the thought processes. He's given us a spirit of saved thinking. Folks, listen, the salvation of the head is very important. If I can't get your head saved first, if you don't have saved thoughts, you're going to be one ridiculous soldier because you're always going to get hurt. i got to get your head straight. That takes discipline, doesn't it? That takes getting the thoughts you used to have changed into the thoughts you need. Helmet of salvation to get your thoughts saved. How cool is that? Okay? This is taking longer than I wanted if that's the sword of the spirit is the first offensive weapon it's the first offensive weapon now I, I looked around to try to find a sword I found one I made this one with the armor this is one killer sword you know what's really wild is when I first made this I didn't know how to temper it now I do. I can now go back in and make this into a real sword. It would be able to hold an edge. But even as it is right now, oh, not even hardened. I could take somebody's head off. Anybody want to see? Okay, Rick will sell. <laughs> Just by sheer force and shape, sloppy. it's going to be sloppy. There's going to be blood everywhere. It's going to be, okay. It's going to rip more than cut. Okay. I loaned it, I kept it up here at a youth pastor's place. I said, okay, would you take care of myself while I'm in Russia? And I came back, and all of the swords I'd given him were nicked. Somebody in the youth group found them and started playing sword. And one of them was broken off 18 inches. So my sword was broken, and then they put him away. Yeah. So this is a sword. Kind of fascinating. It's the first of the offensive weapons. Do I use my sword as an offensive weapon? Did you know that most of the time I use it as a defensive weapon? When you're in a sword fight, you're going to do an awful lot of defense before you do the offense. you got to get ready to prepare it. Mike will tell you that. Okay, He did fencing. Mike Walsh. He did a lot of fencing. He'll tell you. You do a lot of defense. But they, tell you, they only show you one offensive move. move it's called a thrust. But they show you one, two, three, four, five, six defensive moves and then do all the combinations to get there. Well, you've got to get that sword out of the road that that guy's holding 
So you can do the one move. Thrust. Cool. Okay? But even at that, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the Word is rhema, not logos. Jesus is the logos. He is the whole Word. The difference between Logos and Rhema is Logos is the whole general word. It's like if I came in here and I said, please stand, and everybody stood up. Rhema is if I came in and I said, Laura, stand up. Everybody else didn't stand, just Laura did. Okay? That's a Rhema. It's a specific spoken word. My faith, my sword, works off of a specific spoken word. In other words, if I haven't heard it from God, I don't have a weapon. Uh Uh-oh. Be strong in the Lord. If I haven't heard it from God, I have no weapon. What have you heard from God that gives you the weapon you have? Do you have any weaponry? Are you even able to go into battle? What is the weapon you have? Oh man, I tell you, he has told, showed us a lot. One of the things we do here in this church is we get a lot of teaching. What has God shown you? Guess what? If you don't use your sword, you're a useless soldier. What have you heard from him? What have you heard from him? Just to let you know, by the way, that's real armor, okay? Just thought I'd let you know. Okay. Sandy was thinking that it was plastic. Sandy's from California. Everything's plastic. Okay. <laughs> Verse 18 is usually not, not put into the armor of God, but I do. Because it says, right after that, it says, Through all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the Spirit, and watching to the same thing with all perseverance and petition concerning all the saints. An army that does not communicate with its commander is a dead army. But I think it's the one piece of armor they left out of the Roman armor. They did. They left out the most, one of the most important pieces by not labeling it, but they told about it. With all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the Spirit. There's a piece of armor that they always had. Now, this is not an exact one. This is just... One. But a soldier always had his lance. And I, I'm going to make one or buy one. I'll show you what it really was. Okay? It's a cute little thing. It's half wood with a shaft coming out of it about this long with a little bitty head, diamond-shaped head on it, and then a cap on the back side of the wood that's a point. Okay? That's what we use in California. That's what we use in California. Okay. Why would they have that? And they would wear that on their back, slung on their back, and they'd just pull it out. And, and it was not tempered. This is what's really funny. is It's made out of soft steel. The shaft was. Soft sheet. Why? They would throw it one time, and the chances are, if it killed somebody, it killed them. But if it didn't kill them, if they got into their armor, it would bend so they couldn't throw it back. That's sneaky, isn't it? <laughs> okay. But with this... Now, with my sword, I could throw my sword, but then I'm kind of like, oops, you know? In one of the Three Musketeers movies, this guy had learned how to, from his sword, just went and threw it, and it stuck in something. And he says, what do you think? And they said, only Porthos could figure out a way of disarming himself. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that'd about do it. Okay. But from here, I could get Mike in the back row. Fact is, that would be an easy throw. (laughs) <laughs> hit my hand, hit my hand. I could get Roxanne, but that's a little bit further from my arm. There's a possibility of getting Marty in the back in the booth, but boy, that's a very small target from here. And with my old eyes and arms, I'd have to run halfway and throw it. So. But it gives me distance, doesn't it? I can do stuff that's outside of my normal reach. That's what prayer and petition is about. It's going beyond what I can normally do. If that cuts that cord, I'll be in trouble. Okay? This is kind of fascinating, but it says praying at all times, how? In the Spirit. Paul wrote Ephesians. Paul also wrote 1 Corinthians where he talks about, I will pray in my mind, I will pray with tongues. And called that praying in the Spirit. And I'll be really honest with you. Um, We've had so many people, that, so many churches that said, we want to do the Married for Life course, but can you do it without talking about tongues? And we said, no. Why? Why would I send somebody into a warfare without the weaponry to fight? And I'll tell you something. 
Without tongues, you're not equipped enough for the major battles. And I'll be really honest with you, and I'm, just, I'm not going to teach much on this. I'm just going to slide the statement out there and run away. Okay? And that is this. Prayer in tongues is perfect prayer because you're with your understanding, cannot understand everything that's happening around you. You do not know what's coming against you. You do not know how to pray. And most of the time when you pray about somebody, is with a judgment involved, and so you're praying wrongly. Are you going to hear from God or not hear from God? You've got to pray correctly. And listen, tongues is how that works. When you pray in tongues, you pray perfect prayer in a perfect place, right where the Lord directs it. It is communications of the Holy Spirit doing that thing. And that's it. That's all the teaching you're going to get on it. Really cool. But I'll tell you, I will not send somebody out in warfare without preparing them with tongues. Won't do it. Just won't do it. In Isaiah 59, 16 through 18, it says this. And he saw that there was no man. This was God. And he was astonished that there was no intercessor. And his own arm saved for him, and his righteousness sustained him. For he put on righteousness like armor, and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on robes of vengeance as clothing, and he put on zeal like a mantle. Whoa. Whoa. So the armor of God is what? Paul knew this. He knew that the armor of God was God's armor. That's why it's called the armor of God. Wasn't that brilliant? I mean, I just snuck up on you there. It's God's armor, which is kind of fascinating. Because since it's his armor, when I wear it, I look like him. In the spirit room, enemy can't tell a difference. He just knows I'm in trouble. I'm going to back this up for just a second. Look at this down here. It says, According to works, so he will repay. Fury to his foes, recompense to his foes. He will repay recompense to the coasts. And that doesn't mean just the coasts are going to get it. It means he's going to do it in the inlands and go all the way to the coast. The idea to the coast means to the nine yards, to the full, to the everything. He's going to recompense. Okay? The reason I brought that up is because if it's his armor... He's letting me wear it. It's the same thing like putting on his robe, isn't it? When I fight, I am fighting in his name. I'm fighting in him. That's why I've got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Folks, don't go into battle in your own strength. It won't work. Romans 12, 18 through 19 says this. If possible, from you, from you, being in peace with all men, not avenging yourselves, beloved, but giving place to wrath, for it has been written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And that's out of Deuteronomy 32. Okay? So what if somebody does something against me? It's not up to me to make vengeance. It's not my place. What am I supposed to do? Do what he commanded me to do and forgive him. Oh, that hurts. Somebody does something against me, what am I supposed to do? Forgive him. It's not up to me. It's up to my covenant partner who gave me his weapons and he said that he will do my fights. End of discussion. Will he bring enemies in my life that will do stuff against me? Yes. Why? For me to learn how to forgive. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's definitely true. What's he want you to do? Forgive. But that's not easy. I didn't say it's going to be easy. But it is right. Why? Because what are you supposed to do with your enemies? Kill them! No. Love them. Ooh. Love my enemies? Ooh. That just doesn't sound right. Right. Because you don't have safe thinking yet. Safe thinking tells you it's best to love your enemies. That way they have no hold on you. And then you can pray for them. Get them out of the hands of the true enemy. And then you have what? Another comrade. Makes sense. They're not the enemy. Love them. In Deuteronomy, this is out of Deuteronomy. See where it says Deuteronomy 32, 35? Deuteronomy 31 and 32 is fascinating because Moses is talking to the children of Israel and God gives him a word for them and it says, these are the children of Israel. They're going to go in the land and they're going to walk away from my covenant and I'm going to have to destroy them. Thank you, God. Appreciate that. He says, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you a song. I'm going to give you a song, and I want you to teach it to the children of Israel. And they have to sing the song all the time. I want you to teach it, because they're going to have to know it. And Psalm 32 is the song of vengeance. And that's what it is all about. And it has nothing to do with you going out and taking care of your enemies. It's about me doing it. I am God. I am going to take care of it. So here's your homework assignment. Your homework assignment is to read Deuteronomy 31 and 32, because I don't have time to do it here. Okay. Got it? What's your homework? 
And I will ask. Have you back up your boy? Okay, in Ephesians 5, it says this, 6 through 8. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for through these things the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. The who? The sons of disobedience. Ooh, the sons, but they're being disobedient. The wrath of God. Then do not become partakers with them, for then, for you then were darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You see, we have a choice to walk in Him or out of Him. And when we choose to walk in darkness, guess what? We become sons of disobedience. And then guess what? It's God's wrath on us. And then guess what? We're outside of God's armor. And then guess what? We're open game. We're walking around with, sh- with a target between our shoulder blades, which I thought was reserved only for pastors. <laughs> that was a good line, wasn't it? Yeah. Luke 18, 7 through 8 says, And will God not at all execute the avengement of his elect, those crying to him day and night, also having been long-suffering over them? I say to you that he will carry out the avengement of them speedily, but the Son of Man coming then, will he find faith on the earth? The issue isn't vengeance, but faith. Who do I cry out? There's my enemies. They're doing damage. What do I do? I cry out to my covenant partner saying, Covenant partner, you gave me your weapons. You said you would fight my fight. Lord God, there it is. And then let it go. Forgive them, love them, pray for them, do all that good stuff and let it go. But the one who's going to do it is God himself. And we keep saying, well, how long, O Lord, just like David did? Well, how long, O Lord? I've given you 10 minutes and they're not dead yet. Come on, God. Blast his kneecaps. Hey, David has a whole plethora of things he asked God to do to these people. But that changes when you get in the New Testament. It does. People say, well, that's, that's, that's God's people. I said, by inspiration. Yeah, God is going to do that very same thing to those people. But it's not your place to ask him for it. It's not your place to go that on them. What's your place? Forgive them, pray for them, turn them over to God. I told the guy one day, I says, you know, you're being really stupid about this. And he says, why? I says, you know the scripture. Do you really want me to turn you over to God? Or are you going to straighten up here? You are becoming the enemy here. You are fighting what God is saying. You really want to do that? Pay attention. Because I will turn you over to the Lord. Boy, I play dirty. I just, I don't play fair at all. <laughs> Notice that evil little laugh. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 4, 6 through 7, and Jim can quote this. Can't you, Jim? <laughs> Not to go beyond to overreach his brethren the matter. This is all talking about, this is all stuff we learned at the Purity Conference. Because the avenger concerning all these things is the Lord, even as we told you before and solemnly testified, for God did not call us to impurity but to purity. What? When I lust after a man's wife, what have I done? I've gone against that man. When I lust over a man's daughter, what have I done? I've gone against that man. And God says, do not go beyond and overreach in the matter of your brother. Oh, why? Because the avenger of all these things is God. Think he's messing around? Folks, I'm telling everybody how godly I am, and I sit there, and I want to do all sorts of manner of perversion to one of God's daughters. Ooh. <laughs> we should be afraid. <laughs> It should scare the brains out of us. And we're going, oh, that was nice. Well, not a big deal. I had one guy say, well, if I don't lust after, it doesn't matter because somebody else is still going to. I've heard some very brilliant things from people. <laughs> the subject is sexual purity. The avenger of such things is the Lord. Protection is the issue. I no longer have my enemies. I have his. Oh, that's supposed to make me feel good? I have God's enemies. They're mine. <laughs> oh, that's cool. What should I do with my old enemies? Oh, well, love them. In Him, I am totally protected. It's my problem when I'm not in Him. And therein lies the rub. Therein lies the rub. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, and Jim can quote this one too. For walking about in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful to God, to the demolition of strongholds, the demolishing, 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 demolishing of arguments and every high thing lifting itself up against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every single thought into the obedience of Christ. 
Now that's our warfare. But our warfare is divinely powered, not manly powered. I think this is kind of fascinating. What can Satan do against you? He says, well, there's no temptation that has taken you but what is common to man. So all Satan can do is do what's common to man to you. That's his limit. What can you do to him? What is common to God? Cool. <laughs> Who wins? Why are we walking around in fear of the enemy? All you do is tempt me, trick me, fake me out. But if I'm paying attention to what the Lord is saying, he can't do that. I win. And the weapons of my warfare are divinely powered. I win. Why should I ever walk around losing? It's not flesh. Not flesh armor, but God's armor. But it says bringing every captive, every thought, and bring it to the obedience of Christ. Into the obedience of Christ. Meaning what? My thoughts have got to be brought into submission. I listened to a guy this last week who called me on the phone and he says, I'm having all these thoughts of death. I says, why are you entertaining them? Why don't you stop them? Whose brain is it? Are you saying that your brain is out of control and the enemy has control of your brain? Is that what you're telling me? Why are you listening to them? Listen, folks, why are you listening to something that you know is a lie? Stop it. Stop it. You say, how do I know it's a lie? Well, for one, does it follow the scripture? For two, what has God said to you? Take it to him. If you can't take it to him, if you're having a real hard time dealing with this lie, bring it to somebody else and we'll help you. Well, well what do we do? We'll just take you straight to God and let God tell you. And we'll try to figure out the hindrance of why you're hearing it and not hearing from God. Simple, not easy, but simple. Get rid of the lies. What are you hearing? Take that thought captive and drag that thing into obedience to Jesus Christ. Sometimes it takes that, doesn't it? Okay, thought, I've had enough of you. <sighs> You're going to obey Christ if I have to thrash you in the process, which might be fun. You will obey. Because why? Because the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. <laughs> Okay, am I still making sense so far? Romans 13, 12 through 14 says, Also this, knowing the time that is now the hour for you to be aroused from sleep. For now our salvation is newer than when we believed. The night is far gone. The day is drawn near. Then let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the weapons of light. Isn't that cool? It's time. Let's do this. Let us walk becomingly as in the day and not in carousings and drunkennesses and cohabitation and lustful acts, not in fighting and envy, but put on, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and do not make forethought for the flesh for its lusts. How cool. Man, if we just lived that one, we'd always walk in victory. Isn't that amazing? Putting on the weapons means doing the work of light. Instead of the works of darkness, it must be doing the works of light. Cast off the works of darkness and put on, put on the weapons of light. Isn't that fascinating? Now, since Ron asks, okay, it's the aorist, imperative, middle. Ron knows all this stuff. It just, I, it's, it's, whew. meaning what? It's simple action. It's in the imperative, which means as soon as you hear it, start doing it. It's in the middle voice, which means you do it to yourself. And he's saying, cast off the works of darkness, put on the weapons of light, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do it to yourself. I put it on. It always cracks me up when people say, every morning when I wake up, I put on the armor of God. My question to them is, why are you sleeping without it? I don't take it off. I don't want to take it off. I want to sleep in it. Why? Righteousness, truth, it's good stuff. Faith, you know. Yeah, I'm lounging in it. Yeah, it's like that's about right. Of course, the armor of, of God is a lot more comfortable than this stuff. <laughs> Protection. What? Me worry? Right back to Rick's life motto. Okay. Yeah, we're working on that. <laughs> okay. Who has greater power? Now, I almost put a yin and yang up there, but I couldn't find a good one. Yin and yang. That's those two things in the circle. One is white with a black dot. The other is black with a white dot. And they're always going around this circle. That's an Eastern philosophy that says that good and evil are equal. And inside of good is a little bit of evil. 
and inside of evil is a little bit of good. And I come against that thing that is a lie from the pit of hell. And does hell have a pit? Yes, it does. <laughs> I keep asking her, hell has a pit? Can you prove that? Anyway, <laughs> it's a lie right out of hell. Why? Because good and evil are not equal. Good wins. Good is much more powerful than evil. Is there evil in good? No. Is there any good in evil? No. It's just the whole thing's a lie. How would you rather graph it? All white. Why think about anything else? There is no evil. What is darkness? The absence of light. What is evil? The absence of God. Wow. All I have to do is obey. Now there's a good statement. <laughs> what have you heard from God? <laughs> do you really want to obey that? Yes. Is it going to cost you? Oh, yeah. 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 No problem. My personal war is being won by him. It makes me free to go where he calls me to go. Now, listen. Here's the lie. Here's the sacred cow we're killing. Oh, you don't want to make the devil mad. He'll come and get you. Oh, shut up. No. I want to make the devil mad because he can't get me. I don't like him much. I've never seen him do any good in anybody's life. I'm out after him. I am aggressively pursuing him. I'm trying my hardest to get lives without him. I hate him. He knows it. I'm out after him. Does he have a vendetta against me? It doesn't matter. My faith, above all, I'm covered by the shield of faith. And my armor is the armor of my covenant partner. And when I'm doing his stuff, nothing the devil can do can get through to me. And I can sit and just in his face. No problem. In his face, no problem. The second one was more productive. I mean it, folks. Let's get rid of this thing about walking around being afraid of the enemy. Suck prunes. He is nothing to be afraid of. No longer. Man, we need to walk around in our victory. Okay? Now what? I didn't know this was up here. Okay. Here, oh yeah, this is good. <laughs> I remembered. <laughs> Hear me, coastlands and you people from afar, and prick up your ear. Jehovah called me from the womb. He mentioned my name from my mother's belly, and he made my mouth like a sharp sword. He hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me a polished arrow. He hid me in his quiver. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel. You in whom I shall be glorified. Oh, I love this. I am his sword and in the shadow of his hand. I am his polished arrow. He hides me in his quiver. Meaning what? I am his weapon. And I'll do this very, very quickly because I want you to understand how this works for me. This is the sword from the third Lord of the Rings movie. Um, this is the one known as Andriel, Flame of the West. Why? In the movie, Elendil was the king, and he was coming against Sauron the bad guy. Sauron the bad guy had a ring of power that was causing him to have great power, and he was winning. Elendil went to fight him, and Sauron killed him. His sword fell. Elendil's son picked up the, went to pick up the sword, and Sauron the bad guy stepped on it, broke the sword. So it broke off about here. So it was only about this much of it. But with this much of it, he reached up and he went, and he cut off the ring of power, and it destroyed the enemy. All along, the prophecy was that that was the name of that sword was Narsil, that Narsil, the shards of Narsil was broken, were going to be reforged so that the king of Gondor would have power. Then comes along Aragorn. They reforge Narsil. In the last movie, they come and they hand it to him. And they say, here it is. Take this into the paths of the dead and you will make an army that is unbeatable. I thought that was cool. Man, I was just, I'm just stoked by this until one day the Lord said to me, Lee, you're not a warrior. My entire life, spiritual life, had been wrapped around the fact that I was a warrior. I did everything as a warrior. I prayed as a warrior. I preached as a warrior. I witnessed as a warrior. I did everything as a warrior. And God says, you're not a warrior. Now, that just takes your identity and just flushes it right down the toilet, doesn't it? And I went, God, what do you mean I'm not a warrior? 
oh man. Sometimes you have to hear twice because you heard the words, but you didn't hear what was behind the words. He said, you're a warrior, and I listened again. You're not a warrior. And I heard him laugh. It was a good thing. Well, uh-huh. Okay, Lord, what do you mean I'm not a warrior? You must have something. And he told me, you're a sword in the hand of the warrior. And I went, yes! That was so much better. Now I've got a different identity. Because it's really cool. Because I hang right there on the warrior. I don't have to go looking for a fight. It's up to him to make me. It's up to him to fine sharpen it. It's up to him to keep it clean. It's up to him. And then he takes it into battle. And when he walks into the battle, he looks at this thing. I'm still not worried. I have not been worried from word one. Why? Because it's not my battle. I'm in the hand of the warrior who comes and he pulls me out when he wants to. And the warrior knows how to swing me. There was a day I was still the sword, but the enemy broke me, and I was a useless sword. But in my brokenness, as Narsil was broken, God used that to cut the ring of power, the, the pornography, out of my life. And I cut the ring of power off. And then God started working on that sword, and he reforged me, and he put me through fire, he put me through hammering, he put me through all the stuff that I know that happens now in a forge. And he made me into a sword that has the badge of authority on it. And I can go into the paths of the dead and I can raise an army that cannot be beaten. That's why he said, I'm buying this sword. This is Andriel, the badge of authority of the king. I am Lee. I carry the badge of authority of the king. And I don't have to look for a fight. All I have to do is just hang around with the warrior and he pulls me and heads will roll. Isn't that too cool? And sometimes I walk in my office and I'll see Andriel hanging on the wall and it just sparks up in me. Today. Yeah, I can just hear him. Today. I'm going to swing you today. I'll sit in the middle of a session knowing that God is going to pull me out of the sheath and things are going to but it's not because of me. It's because of who he has made me be and he's the one that's swinging me and I will win. Isn't that amazing? Well, perfect sermon. I get to use all my weapons. Are you willing and able to trust him? <laughs> I need to be concentrating on doing His commands. He has clothed me in armor. (laughs) I'm invincible. I love this. I must trust Him to fight. His battles. His way. Identity, provision, and protection. He's given it to me in His robe, His garments, His weapons. We win. Isn't that cool? Is that cool or what? Did you learn something today? I'm hoping... I'm ho- uh, this is, like I said, this is a mini-conference, just a mini-seminar on spiritual warfare, but I want to give us the attitude. What's the attitude? We win. We win. Why are we whining? Let's kill that cow. And let's go on with life. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, today. I give you praise and glory and honor for what you're doing. Lord, thank you for this message. Thank you, Lord, that you are the mighty warrior dressed for battle. Holy Lord God is he. Lord, you win. We can walk into the land and in victory. And we give you the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Go with God. Be blessed and walk in victory, would you? Amen.